Thank you, Barbie, and it was read very well as well. Thank you, much appreciated. <laughs> So what book or movie has the worst ending? There are many books, movies and series which are engrossing, engaging and captivating but are undone by a terrible conclusion. Maybe the stories just resolve too easily or they marry the wrong person or it's just deeply unsatisfying. One literary commentator compiled a list of what they thought were the 10 worst endings in all of literature. And they said, endings are very, very hard. Each of these is a good book written by someone of great skill who, for whatever reason, choked, rushed, or otherwise ran the narrative off a cliff. Now, I wonder if you could guess any of the books they suggested had the worst endings. Some of them might surprise you. Well, they actually suggested the worst endings in all of literature belonged to books such as the Adventures of Huckleberry Finn, Little Women, and even Harry Potter and the Deathly Hallows. Now, you might have your own opinions on what books or movies have disappointing endings. Now, I actually spent a year of my life reading Stephen King's epic series, The Dark Tower, only to be deeply disappointed by the ending. Over 4,000 pages and over 1.2 million words and as I came to the dramatic conclusion and I read the ending and I felt myself shouting at the pages, no, 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 it can't end like that. And it did. It was so disappointing. Many are actually critical of the uh, ending of the film Titanic. Here we are. Surely there was enough room on that broken door for both Jack and Rose to hold on and both be saved. And in fact, even the TV show Mythbusters demonstrated that Jack's death was in fact needless. And then there's the War of the Worlds. Surely a powerful and advanced alien civilization couldn't really be defeated so easily and comprehensively by the common cold. There are many books, movies and stories with disappointing and unsatisfying endings. Yet perhaps surprisingly, the story of the Old Testament should be included at the top of the list of the worst endings ever. After the whole gripping story of promise, hope, twists and drama, the ending is an absolute fizzer. It's totally anticlimactic. So what happens to make the ending of the Old Testament so bad? Well, we'll see today that we, as we look at the books of Ezra and Nehemiah, which, we, which recount the final episode in the Old Testament history. Now, these books start really well. It all seems like things are heading in the right direction and it's going to resolve itself satisfactorily. But the ending is, well, we'll see for ourselves, a real stinker. Now, this final episode of the Old Testament begins with Jerusalem in ruins the temple destroyed, and the people of God exiled to Babylon. But the book of Ezra describes an astonishing turn of geopolitical events. The Babylonian Empire, which destroyed and exiled the nation of Judah, is itself conquered in 539 BC by the new global superpower, Persia, and their king, Cyrus the Great. After he takes power, Cyrus, King Cyrus makes an astonishing move. Perhaps in order to create a defensive buffer against the more significant international powers like Egypt and Greece. But nevertheless, we read some long overdue good news at the beginning of Ezra, where it says, In the first year of Cyrus, king of Persia, in order to fulfill the word of the Lord spoken by Jeremiah, the Lord moved the heart of Cyrus, king of Persia, to make a proclamation throughout his realm and also to put into writing this is what King Cyrus of Persia says the Lord the God of heaven has given me all the kingdoms of the earth and has appointed me to build a temple for him in Jerusalem in Judah any of his people among you may go up to Jerusalem in Judah and build the temple of the Lord the God of Israel um, the God who is in Jerusalem and may their God be with them 
and in any locality where survivors may now be living, the people are to provide them with silver and gold, with goods and livestock, and with free will offerings for the temple of God in Jerusalem. So Cyrus, this pagan king of Persia, is allowing the Judean exiles to return home and to rebuild their temple. And intriguingly, this foreign policy has actually been confirmed by the Cyrus Cylinder, which describes a policy allowing at least some people who'd been subjugated by Babylon to return to their homelands and establish their local religious norms. Now this remarkably generous act on Cyrus's part probably, as I said, had geopolitical military purpose, but nevertheless, the returnees saw the hand of God in this. And so perhaps now, with the return of the exiles to Jerusalem, the promises of God might actually finally come true. And so the book of Ezra recounts the return of God's people to Jerusalem. And we see that finally, maybe the people have learned their lessons. God's people were conquered and exiled because of their disobedience and disloyalty to God. But in Ezra 3, 2, we start to see that they actually are reading the law of God and actually starting to follow his instructions. Then Joshua, son of Josadak, and his fellow priests and Zerubbabel, son of Shealtiel, and his associates began, the altar of, to, began to build the altar of the Lord of Israel to sacrifice burnt offerings on it in accordance with what is written in the law of Moses, the man of God. So then it's actually natural that they start rebuilding the temple of God. What was shattered under Nebuchadnezzar and the Babylonians is being rebuilt. And they lay the foundations to great fanfare. So in Ezra 3 continues, When the builders laid the foundations of the temple of the Lord, the priests in their vestments with, all, with their trumpets and the Levites, the sons of Asaph, Asaph with cymbals, took their places to praise the Lord as prescribed by David, king of Israel. With praise and thanksgiving they sang to the Lord, He is good, His love towards Israel endures forever. And all the people gave a great shout of praise to the Lord because the foundation of the house of the Lord was laid. But the reaction to the foundations being laid is mixed and intriguing. Um, but many of the older priests and Levites and family heads who had seen the former temple wept aloud when they saw the foundation of this temple being laid, while many others shouted for joy. No one could distinguish the sound of shouts of joy from the sound of weeping because the people made so much noise and the sound was heard far away. So notice here that there are two reactions to the foundations of the temple being laid. One is joy, for the temple of God is being rebuilt. But this is also mixed with weeping. It was the older priests and Levites who had seen the former temple and they wept. Now, why, why did they weep? Was it because they were so overcome with emotion that things were back on track and the, the glory of God was to be restored? Well, possibly. But I think that the weeping is recorded by way of contrast to the shouts of joy. The young people rejoiced, but the older generation wept. They were probably happy, but they were, they were pleased that the temple was being built. But looking at the foundations of this new temple, it just wasn't going to have the same glory as the previous temple. And so perhaps this is just a glimpse that the return to Jerusalem is just not going to match the glory of Solomon's temple and the riches and power that Judah experienced under David and Solomon. Maybe this is an ominous sign that the return of the exiles, or the return from the exile, is not going to end happily. Indeed, the return to Jerusalem is a bittersweet experience. The return just hasn't matched their, lived up to their expectations. It's a little bit like my return to Australia after living in the UK for three years as a youth. I was 12 years old and I was so looking forward to coming back to Australia. In fact, I was so looking for, so much so that I was counting down the days. In fact, I was counting day, down the days, the two things that I was looking forward to the most. Christmas Day and the 31st of December when we flew back to Australia. And I remember one lunchtime at school, at school, I was standing in the queue for lunch, and one of my classmates just asked the question, so I wonder how many days there are till Christmas? And I responded, quick as a flash, no thinking time at all, 46. 
And my friend looked a bit stunned and he got out a calculator. I mean, he think he might have had a calculator on his digital watch because, you know, it was the 80s. Um, and, he, and he worked out, oh yeah, it really was 46 days to Christmas, which meant it was just 52 days for me to fly back to Australia. I had high expectations and I was so excited about returning back to Australia. Yet about a month or so after I had returned, I distinctly felt, I, just, I remember this, distinctly remember feeling underwhelmed. Life back in Australia just hadn't lived up to my heady, overly idealistic expectations. Now I didn't weep like the people of God, but it was disappointing. And hence I've been trying to return to the UK ever since. That's why, you know, watching Escape to the Country is a particularly difficult experience <laughs> in some sense. But the experience of the people of God returning to Jerusalem was bittersweet. They would have sung their own bittersweet symphony. Great to be back in the promised land, but it just wasn't quite matching their expectations or their memories, nor of what was promised by God. So the foundations of the temple were established and then the temple was eventually finished a few years' time by the time of King Darius. And the rebuilding of the temple seems to be a metaphor for the hearts of the people. The people who actually seem to keen to rebuild their relationship and their devotion to God. Hence, under Ezra, they dedicate the temple, re-establish the Levit Levitical priesthood. They carry out the Passover and then seem, just to seem determined to follow the Lord and to do what was written in the book of Moses. Even conscious of for marrying foreign women, the thing which led Solomon's heart astray. And so the exiles return with high hopes and what seems to be a renewed sense of being obedient to the Lord. But there are just glimpses of foreboding or impending doom. The smaller, yet less spectacular temple indicates that this return to the glorious Jerusalem could well be a disappointing experience. But after the rebuilding of the temple, things do seem back on track. The temple's restored, the priesthood's rest a Levitical priesthood re-established, and the people seem to have a new desire to be obedient. And so then Jewish leader Nehemiah leads the construction and the rebuilding of Jerusalem itself, God's holy city. Now perhaps the rebuilding of the walls was a symbol of a boundary marking out the people of God from the peoples around them. Perhaps Nehemiah had a desire to match the greatness of God with the, the greatness of Jerusalem. Perhaps in some sense the physical state of Jerusalem represented the spiritual state of God's people where the walls were a concrete reminder of God's covenant promises to Abraham. A reminder of the promise that the land of Israel and the city of Jerusalem will be the impregnable Home of God's people. Maybe it was a combination of all these. Nevertheless, Nehemiah began a rebuilding project. And so they rebuilt the city. And despite setbacks and opposition, the walls of Jerusalem were constructed in just, and completed in just 52 days. Now I'm sure our resident fence builder Arthur would have appreciated these walls. But I'm not sure even he could have rebuilt the walls of an entire city in less than two months. Maybe they, didn't quite, maybe they didn't require quite as many compliance checks as they do today. But this work also had divine help. Nehemiah 6. So the war was completed on the 25th of Elol in 52 days. When all our enemies heard about this, all the surrounding nations were afraid and lost their self-confidence because they realised that this work had been done with the help of God. So things really are heading in the right direction. The exiles are back in the land, there's a temple, now the city's fortified and protected. Perhaps a new era of God's blessing and prosperity is about to begin. Well, this may well be the case. So the people actually seem motivated to obey the Lord. In fact, God's people gather regularly to hear Ezra read the law. And then on the 24th of the month, the people gather for a special day of teaching and worship, reading the law and recommitting their, themselves to him. And Nehemiah 9 describes this day and describes their confession. And in so doing, summarizes basically the whole story of the Old Testament. Right from the very beginning of creation, through to the promises of Abraham, through to the exodus from Egypt and the law, it recounts the tale of 
God's promises, faithfulness and blessings, and Israel's repeated unfaithfulness. It accurately describes God's people as presumptuous, stiff-necked, and disobedient. Now, stiff-necked doesn't mean that they, they forgot the physio appointment. It's an expression meaning proud and stubborn. And this is a great summary of the attitude of the Israelites. So, for example, in the desert, after receiving the law, verses 16 and 17, but they, our ancestors, became arrogant and stiff-necked. They did not obey your commands. They refused to listen and failed to remember the miracles you performed among them. And again, they've described after entering the promised land and prospering, verse 26. But they were disobedient and rebelled against you. They turned your backs on your law. They killed your prophets who had warned them in order to turn them back to you. They committed awful blasphemies. Yet despite their disobedience, this passage shows the steady faithfulness and mercy of God. So to the rebels in the desert, verse 19, because of your great compassion, you did not abandon them in the wilderness. In the promised land, after enemies opposed the people in the book of Judges, in verse 27, but when they were oppressed, they cried out to you. From heaven you heard them, and in your great compassion, you gave them deliverers who rescued them from the hands of their enemies. Indeed, a summary of the people of God and the Lord himself is described in verse 33. In all that has happened to us, you have remained righteous. You have acted faithfully while we acted wickedly. So after confessing and acknowledging this painful and sorry saga, the people now finally appear humble and contrite. They acknowledge and confess their unfaithfulness and remember God's grace and mercy. So perhaps it's time now for the people to obey. Verse 38. In view of all this, we are making a binding agreement, putting it in writing, and our leaders, our Levites, and our priests are affixing their seals to it. They have confessed and they make a new agreement. They really seem committed to obeying God. And as a part of this agreement, they agree to do three things, three specific things. They promise not to intermarry with foreigners, which is the thing that turned Solomon's heart away from the Lord. We promise not to give our daughters in marriage to the peoples around us and take their daughters for their sons. They also promise to obey the Sabbath. Uh, when the neighbouring peoples bring merchandise or grain to sell on the Sabbath, we will not buy from them on the Sabbath or any other holy day. Every seventh day we will forego working the land and will cancel all the debts. And finally, they promise to look after the Levites and the temple, the house of God. So we assume the responsibility for carrying out the commands to give a third of a shekel each year for the service of the house of our God. Three promises, three things, if done, which would make them very different from their stiff-necked ancestors. They make an undertaking to not neglect, neglect God or his commandments. They're finally, finally promising to be the holy people of God, the people God wanted them to be. So now the story is set for the grand finale. Finally, after centuries of disobedience, intermarriage, unfaithfulness and disloyalty, the people have sorted themselves out. Now at this particular point in the narrative, and in, Israel, and in Israel's history, Nehemiah himself is reassigned to Babylon to report to the king. So he leaves Jerusalem to go back to, to Babylon. Now Babylon's no Lord Howe Island or Malta, but he was away. And he was away for some time. And so his absence would be a test to see how deep the reforms that he initiated extended. It will test the people to see how genuine their contrition and desire to serve the Lord really was. So, some time later, we're not really sure how long, but it must have been at least a few years, Nehemiah asks for permission to return to Jerusalem just to see how things have fared in his absence. So what does he see when he returns back to the promised land to Jerusalem? Does he see an emerging paradise, a land of milk and honey, the people loving and obeying the Lord and finally being the holy people of God, bringing him praise and glory. Is that what he defines? Nehemiah 13 describes his, what he sees. 
And he says, I also learned that the portions assigned to the Levites had not been given to them and that all the Levites and musicians responsible for the service had gone back to their own fields. So I rebuked the officials and asked them, why is the house of God neglected? Then I called them together and stationed them at their posts. Unfortunately, he sees spiritual neglect. The temple, the house of God, is being neglected. So, ba -ba then in verse 15, in those days I saw the people in Judah treading wine presses on the Sabbath and bringing in grain and loading it on donkeys, together with wine, grapes, figs, and other all kinds of loads. And they were bringing all this into Jerusalem on the Sabbath. Again, neglect. The Sabbath is not being observed. And then verses 23 to 24. Moreover, in those days I saw men of Judah who had married women from Ashdod, Ammon, and Moab. Half of their children spoke the language of Ashdod and or the language of one of the other peoples and did not know how to speak the language of Judah. Disobedience, intermarriage with women from other nations. This is not a holy and distinct people of God. This is not paradise. This is disobedience, corruption and disloyalty to God, just like their stiff-necked ancestors. This isn't ending very well. There is a saying, when the cat's away, the mice will play. And it appears the mice have played in, the absence of, in Nehemiah's absence. And the people have fallen into old habits of disobedience and disloyalty to the Lord. Now Nehemiah is understandably angry. He rebukes the people. He institutes some more reforms. But he's fighting a losing battle. The weight of disobedience and the temptations of the people is too much. And despite his initiatives and his zeal for the Lord, he's going to lose. The walls are up, there was a temple, but the hearts of the people were still hearts of stone. The spirit had not yet come and so despite their best intentions, the people were weak and disobedient. So tragically, whilst Jerusalem was rebuilt and the covenant renewed, but the people's hearts haven't changed. Now a few weeks back we introduced the faithfulness ometer, a device which measured faithfulness. You know, perhaps as I said with the unit of, of measurement of this unit would be the trustopactyl or something, I'm not sure exactly what it would be, but now that we've actually completed the Old Testament part of the greatest story ever told, what sort of rating do you think you would give to, for God? What, 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 the faithfulness of God according to his promises. Out of, say, 10, what would you give out of 10? Faithfulness of God to his promises, what would you say? Anyone want to throw out a... Three. Ten. Ten? Ten? Faithfulness of God to his promises. Oh. oh so, 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 <laughs> ten. Okay, I was gonna, okay, I wasn't sure if you were following the same story as I was. Yeah, so there's a few others saying 10. Anyone else going to go 10? Uh, yeah, I think faithfulness of God, 10. He's faithful to his promises. Okay. What would you give though for the nation of Israel or Judah, the faithfulness of God's people in keeping their promises? A three, you give a three. Anyone else? What else would people give? Anyone want to? Zero. Everyone's <laughs> going for zero. Anybody else? Any other? Two. Okay. Yeah. It's it's not a pass, is it? It's not really a pass. Um, they're a frustrating and faithless bunch. So even now in this final episode, when things looked like they were going to change, the people's hearts haven't changed. They're disobedient. And so here, the Old Testament ends. Nehemiah 13 is the final chapter of the narrative history of the nation of Israel. And it's an absolute lead balloon of an ending. It's more disappointing than Titanic, War of the Worlds, The Dark Tower, or Harry Potter. Now all these promises of hope and forgiveness and glory and blessing ends with Nothing. Barely a whimper. And if I were creating a work of fiction, I would not have ended it like this. God's people in disobedience and a frustrated Nehemiah. The experience of the people of God in Nehemiah's time shows the impossibility of following the law by willpower alone. Humans are so easily, distraction, so easily distracted 
from devotion to the Lord. For God's people are in the, air, are in the land, but they're hardly a holy people. God's promises are incomplete. There's no blessing. And so that's it. The Old Testament ends. But the good news is that this isn't the end of the story. <laughs> For there was a prophecy from the final Old Testament book, the last of the Old Testament prophets, Malachi, or as some have said, the Italian prophet, Malachi. Um, but Malachi um, 3.1 says, I will send my messenger who will prepare the way before me. Then suddenly the Lord you are seeking will come to his temple. The messenger of the covenant whom you desire will come, says the Lord Almighty. There is a promise of a messenger, of one who will prepare the coming of the Lord himself. The Lord who will be the great king of his people, who will be a great messenger of the covenant and will come to his temple. The hope that the people were seeking, the one Nehemiah was so desperate to honour and glorify, was promised to come. For the greatest story ever told has a huge twist, a twist which turns an absolute fizzer of an ending into the best and most satisfying ending of all. A twist in which stiff-necked people are transformed into faithful disciples of the king. A twist which brings a genuine solution to disobedience and disloyalty. A twist which turns faithless people into the faithful people of God. A twist which can allow the early people, of the, like the early Christian martyr Polycarp, to say on the day of his death, 86 years I have served him and he has done me no wrong. A twist which allows many people in this church, much to my personal encouragement, to remain faithful to the Lord for decades and decades. This twist is not Oliver, but Jesus Christ, by whose death on the cross deals with sin and disobedience once and for all, and who gives his spirit so God can dwell within us, moving us to obedience and trust. And worship. And so the good news is that the tragic and disappointing ending of the Old Testament is not the end. There is hope and good news. For next week, we'll learn of someone who begins their ministry with the words The time has come, the kingdom of God has come near. Repent and believe the good news. So next week, we'll find out more about this good news. And we learn about this great twist, Jesus Christ, whose coming changes the world and brings about a much more satisfying ending. Let's pray. Father, we reflect on the sordid tale of your people in the Old Testament and we bewail their unfaithfulness, disobedience and disloyalty to you. Though you were faithful, your people were wicked and faithless. They were people with hearts of stone. Father, we thank you that Jesus came through his death and resurrection, finally puts sin to death. And we thank you for the gift of your spirit so we are moved to obey him and be faithful to him now and forever to your glory. Amen. Paul writes to the believers in Corinth in 2 Corinthians 3 by saying, You yourselves are our letter, written on our hearts, known and read by everyone. You show that you are a letter from Christ, the result of our ministry, written not with ink, but with the spirit of the living God, not on tablets of stone, but on tablets of the human heart. Let's pray. Father, let us go from here reminded of Jesus' great work for us and renewed by your spirit to live for you and do all things to your glory. Amen. Well, that brings our gathering together to a close this morning. It's great that you can join us this morning and we're glad we managed to survive without 
Esther and Rosemary this morning. We managed to, we got there. Um, so just a reminder, next week we will be having a short memorial for, um, for the life of Bruce, Bruce Jagger, our friend and a member of this congregation for a long, long time. Um, but also we'll be getting, we'll get, get our, the, the greatest story ever told will reach its kind of a dramatic climax in some sense as we look, we finally get to the New Testament and to the person and work of Jesus. But in the meantime, have a great week and we we'll look forward to seeing you next week.